Hey everyone, you are listening to the Divergent Conversations podcast. We are two neurodivergent mental health professionals in a neurotypical world. I'm Patrick Cassell. And I'm Dr. Neff. And during these episodes, we do talk about sensitive subjects, mental health, and there are some conversations that can certainly feel a bit overwhelming. So we do just want to use that disclosure and disclaimer before jumping in. And thanks for listening. Okay, welcome back to Divergent Conversations. Today, Megan and I are going to do some biopsychosocial uh, work that we talked about last week on last week's episode when we were talking about medical conditions and struggles. And we hope you can follow along with us and create your own version of this so that you can fill it in. And that way it helps you track all the information that we're adding to this. Okay, so you're the first one in the hot seat today, Patrick. Okie dokie. Um, so also it's been like seven years since I've done a biopsychosocial, so I might be a little bit rusty. Um, but I'm gonna ask questions and I've got a diagram pulled up. I'll make notes as I listen. Um, and then we'll kind of talk, we'll use it as an anchor for our conversation. So this is, as we mentioned in our last episode, this is a great one to catch on YouTube if you if the visual aid is helpful. Um but sleep is your main is your main thing. So first, yep. just like open in a question. Tell me about your sleep. I'm just going to be listening. Yep. Sure. So sleep has been really challenging since as long as I can remember, even in, as a child. I remember really struggling to fall asleep. My mind would be racing at night. If I did fall asleep, it was not until late into the night. Then I would uh, ultimately sleep all day as a young adult and teenager. Now it's more of, I will fall asleep probably around like 10 o'clock at night, but I wake up constantly. I typically wake up around 2 p 2 AM. I cannot fall back asleep. Once my, once I wake up, I might wake up because I have to pee. I might wake up because the dog needed to go outside. I just might wake up because I've woken up. Um, this ultimately just leads to feeling exhausted all the time. And I have tried all the things like put technology outside of the bedroom, keep your room dark and cool, no distractions, no screen time, read before bed, tried mindfulness. Um, yeah, I've tried a lot of, of things. I've tried different prescription medications. Um, Often, around once or twice a month, I will have a night where I do not sleep a single minute. That actually happened to me two days ago. Um, I just could not fall asleep. I was tired. I was exhausted. I was mentally and physically exhausted, and I could not fall asleep. And it didn't matter what I did. It didn't matter if I switched the environment. It didn't matter if I went into a different room. Um, it just did. It, nothing worked. And those days are really, really challenging, especially the next day because kind of feel delirious okay um so you've tried a lot of things you tried sleep hygiene mindfulness prescriptions like tell me about like what worked what didn't work with those yep so um when i have tried like keeping the room cool and dark that's that's essential i cannot sleep if it's hot i cannot sleep if there's not like a fan or an air conditioning going on i need to hear the noise and i need to have the air ventilation circulation. That's an, that's an absolute must. So sleeping in other environments, hotels, Airbnbs, other people's houses, really, really challenging. Um, mindfulness before bed. We've talked about mindfulness on this podcast before, but it's something that I just often really struggle with. I can't get my mind to slow down and it's just constantly racing, whether it's thoughts of the day, new ideas, something that I may have said in conversation that I'm now like playing back in my head over and over and over again, something really nonsensical, like that doesn't even make sense. That stuff's happening a lot. Prescription meds, I've tried them all from like Ambien, um, Ambien and Lunesta, Lunesta, Lunestra, I don't know. Um, one of those, the ones that are like typically recommended for sleep, I've tried Trazodone, I've tried Ristoril slash Tamazepan, and Honestly, none of them work. Um, Ambien and Trazodone made me feel like zombie-like. 
whether I just was like in a daze, laying in my bed awake, unable to fall asleep, or if I fell asleep, it was really broken sleep, not REM, not deep sleep. And I would wake up feeling unbelievably disoriented, unbelievably lethargic. And temazepam is one that I currently take. It doesn't really have any physical effect. I don't notice it after I take it, but I do think it helps me actually fall asleep. Uh, it does not do anything to keep you asleep, though. So that is really where the big struggle is these days. Yeah, I mean, that's something that struck me was you said you wake up consistently and then struggle to fall back to sleep. Um, yeah. And it sounds like different things are waking you up. So like the dog might wake you up, needing to use the bathroom. What else wakes you up? Yeah. So I've been experiencing um, this like chronic restless leg pain or restless leg syndrome-esque symptoms. So it's almost like this tensing and this intense pressure in my calves and my, my ankles. And I will have to like compulsively uh, constrict them over and over and over again. And they're so painful. And I will end up like circulating or twisting my ankles over and over again to crack them and to alleviate the pressure. And that is something that I'm doing not only subconsciously throughout the day, but it intensifies at night. And that is really challenging. Uh, yep. Um, and have you tried anything for that? So I reached out to my doctor. They did a ferritin level test specifically to see if I had whatever the levels needed to be. Of course, they came back within normal limits. So it offers no solution. I've tried like medicated creams and like things that are prescribed specifically for restless leg syndrome. Nothing has worked on that regard. I did tear my, my calf muscle a couple of months ago playing soccer. I'm sure that plays a role. Um, so it's hard to identify that specific issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, what, so yeah, that's a huge thing that would be waking you up at night. Um, and I've got that in the bio section. Um, and then how much are you waking up to use the bathroom at night? Probably two to three times. Um, okay. How, tell me about like your hydration throughout the day. So like both in regards to like water, um, you mentioned seltzer, but also caffeine and alcohol. Yep. So drink a lot of water. Um, whether it's regular water or carbonated water, just because of my vocal cord damage that I experienced from surgery. Um, my throat always feels dry. I always feel dehydrated. So constantly drinking water, if I had to guesstimate how many ounces, I would say at least 96 ounces of water a day. Then okay. add in probably in the morning and early afternoon, I typically will drink one to two iced coffees ranging in size of 20 ounces to 30 ounces at a Holy time. shit. Okay. <laughs> Let's start there. Wait, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Um, get it. <laughs> okay. Caffeine. Well, and again, you're like so tired. We're not yeah. judging here, but like, no, so it makes I, sense. I, I've I, done that too. So, I you, totally get it. so two, do you say two iced coffees in the afternoon? Usually I'll start at like eight in the morning and I'll have a second one around like noon. Okay. I don't okay. typically drink caffeine past noon. Like on the days where it's one of those nights where I didn't sleep a single second, that might become a three coffee day, but that's not typical. And it's like a 20 ounce iced coffee? Yep. Okay. Um, so if, but if you're drinking it at noon and you're sipping on it, like how long are you? So I don't sip anything. I think that's a problem. But okay. so everything is, is drunk drank very quickly. Um, I probably will drink an iced coffee or a water of that size in about five minutes. Um, so your drink frequency, is that where we're going to put this? I actually just, um, so, um, the, the, wait, all of a sudden I'm blanking. Huberman lab. Is that something, someone you follow? Mm -mm. He's a neuro, um, neuroscientist. He's got some really interesting podcasts, but he actually had a, there's like a two minute clip. We can link to it in our show notes about urination at night. Um, and there's several, several strategies like hydrating well during the day, reducing um, 
liquids in the last few hours of the night. But then this was what was new information to me. How you drink also matters how it comes out of the system. So if you sip on a drink versus gulp it down, right, it um, will also come through the system more slowly. So he also recommends, in addition to drinking less the last few hours of the night, like if you have maybe five to eight ounces in the last few hours to sip it instead of gulp it, and that will also impact how it comes out. So you're drinking like your style of drinking. I'm going to yeah. also put that as a biological. Yeah. Um, or, that makes sense. Cause you're sent, you're like shocking your system. Essentially you're like by gulping something down, you know, you're all of a sudden you're introducing 20 ounces of fluid into your bladder. Like that probably didn't need to be introduced in five minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you do follow the like no caffeine after two rule. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was um, seltzer water, when do you stop that? Um, I probably stopped that earlier in the, in the day as well before like two o'clock. Okay. And I'm then uh, any alcohol at night typically? Yeah, probably two to three nights a week. I'll drink socially with friends and that can look like two to four beers. Um, okay. And any difference in your sleep those nights? Usually I'll fall asleep easier, but I, my mm -hmm. sleep will be very broken. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, what about food? What's your like food look like? Yep. Um, don't eat a ton throughout the day. If I'm being honest, I'll have like something very light in the morning. Usually I'll do like a smoothie, um, cause liquids are just easier. And then lunch, I typically do a lot of delivery cause I don't leave my house very often. And so I'm usually doing like Indian food or I'm doing Asian food a lot of the time. I do put a lot of hot sauce on my food. I know that is a bladder irritant. I know caffeine is a bladder irritant. And when you're saying this stuff out loud, you're like, I know what to do. I know I these things. <laughs> of course we do. Right. But also like food is so comforting. Like, I, so I'm trying to do... I'm trying and failing to do a juice cleanse right now. And I'm realizing like food is one of the few things that I like look forward to in a day, like food yeah. and drink, partly yeah. the sensory experience for me. Also it's spice, it's sweet. Yeah. Um, and it's like one of the soothing things. And when you're like tired and in pain, it's, we go to these things. So Absolutely. yeah. So spicy foods, um, Okay. And when's your kind of last, like last meal of the day, typically? So I was joking with my friend the other day that I really enjoy going out to restaurants for dinner around 5 p.m. because nobody's in them. And See? I yeah. really think that's like my true personality. So um, usually I'm eating dinner around like 5, 530. Mm -hmm. And then do you have any snack before bed? Not typically. Sometimes, like you mentioned sugar last episode, I do love ice cream. It's a, it's a, it's a soft spot for me, but I mean, that's like a once a week thing, but so usually not stacking before bed. Mm -hmm. um, this is outside my scope. So totally over that, but I was just in a book I'm reading on CFS. Um, one of the things he was talking about is how sometimes, especially for those of us, cause hormonal stuff can absolutely play into sleep. Um, and for those of us with like adrenal fatigue, or I think I have to go back and read it. I think he was also talking about restless leg syndrome, but sometimes having like a high protein snack before bed, it'll keep your blood sugar from dropping. And so, cause sometimes it's that drop that wakes us. Um, so I don't know, that could be on your experiment list is trying a high protein snack to see yep. if that does anything. Ooh, I'm going to start an ex maybe experiment list. They start an experiment list for sure. Yep. Um, but again, that's like, I'm not sharing medical information there. That's just something I'm read, I've read that maybe you should try if you want to experiment. Well, um, we'll use the disclaimer again this episode that this, this episode is not designed to give you medical or mental health advice. So everything do at your own discretion. Um, I'm willing to try anything. That's basically what I tell my PCP anytime she suggests something at this stage. I'm like, this has gotten so bad that I don't care. I will try anything that someone suggests at this point. Um, okay. Do you nap during the day? Nope. Never have. 
Never will. Okay. Um, like you can't nap? No, I just can't. Can't fall okay. asleep. Um, yeah. So, and then movement right now. I know you used, you used, used to do a lot of soccer, but you have an injury right now. Are you able to walk? Are you able to walk on it? Like, what's so movement walked, look like? Um, my wife and I have an agreement that I leave the house once a day. Usually it means that I walk to a neighborhood nearby, which is like a 15-minute walk each way to go meet a friend for dinner or to go get a coffee or whatever. Um, I basically walk everywhere I go in Asheville. It's a small city. I don't need to drive very often. So that's helpful. But I'm not moving like high energy or high intensity the way that my body used to. And that used to look like three days of soccer a week, 90-minute games, like super high intensity. So it's a big shift to not really have that. And was there a sleep difference when you were doing that? Um, I think there was probably a little bit of a difference. I know like after games, you're kind of amped up. You have a ton of adrenaline, but like I definitely would sleep longer. Um, I did tear my calf muscle a couple of weeks, months ago playing soccer. So that impacts everything as well. But I've been trying to play pickleball with my friend twice a week now. And that helps get into some movement as well despite my physical therapist telling me not to do that. Oh, interesting. She was like, you know, you have a torn calf, like lateral movement back and forth is going to make it worse. Does that create pain on days you play pickleball? Uh, yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Okay, um, so pain is part of your experience as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, leg pain, Back pain. Back pain. I have chronic back pain because I have two herniated discs. And I also have a torn hip labrum. So my entire right side of the body is probably being overcompensated for by my left side of my body. Okay. Yeah. Does pain also wake you up at night? Only this like weird leg sensation, but not not pain typically. Okay. Um, okay. So often like when um, when doing a biopsychosocial, like I often start with like, walk me through your day. I've kind of had, that's an open-ended question. So I've add, asked you more specifics, specifically around the biological pieces. Right. But is there anything else if it was like, walk me through your day that I haven't asked about, whether it's food, sleep, socializing, work, mm -hmm. things that feel significant? Work is a lot of sitting. Uh, okay. There's a lot of like sitting. I know I have a standing desk and I never use it. Work involves a lot of sitting. Okay. Yeah. Um, and why don't you use the standing desk? Like in your opinion? My opinion is because I'm lazy. Uh, <laughs> well, you're tired. You're like waking uh, up tired. Yeah. So. yeah. It's, 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 exa it's exactly what I said last episode. It's like you're so tired that all these little things that should be easy to do just become one extra thing to do. Mm -hmm. Right, right. No, I 1,000% feel that. Um, okay, so work involves a lot of sitting. Anything else about work? Yeah, we haven't really talked about. Uh, not really. I mean, you know, if it's not podcasting, it's managing a group practice, but that's all virtual. Um, retreats, obviously, but that's, that's only like when those events are happening. I'm on my feet a lot and I'm moving a lot. And I'm, I'm obviously much more social in those environments, but like that's not my typical day. Okay. Um, and work stress, like how stressful would you say your work is? <laughs> well, good thing we just finished our entrepreneurial series where we talked about all the glamorous sides of being an entrepreneur. Um, it's stressful. I mean, it's, it's definitely stressful. I put internal stress on myself, internal pressure. Um, there's stress of owning a group practice that has 20 plus people working for it. Um, I am stressed just about the creation process of my, my other job. I get stressed about like having to market things like we've talked about. Cause I just don't enjoy that. I have RSD related stress to all of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned like mind racing that, that you've always been that way and that's part of your sleep issue is that does work stress show up at night it does yeah whether it comes in like the form of an idea that i feel like i should jump on immediately 
or I think of something I need to tell someone. So I have to get up and like schedule, send the email or the text message so I don't forget. Um, and then if it's in like, you know, retreat season and I'm thinking about an event and all the things that could go wrong. Uh, yeah, it's comes up at night. Okay. Um, is that both make it hard to fall asleep? And when you wake up, do you also do the work rumination stuff? Yep. Okay. Um, outside of work rumination, is there other rumination that's so one thing I love, I, I heard this once. I love it. It's like the mind loves to have an audience. And when you're trying to fall asleep, it's like the mind's like, Ooh, I've got, I've got you all to my attention right now. Let's go. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah. I can ruminate about anything. It could be childhood stuff. It could be something I've been watching or reading. It could be, uh, something nonsensical that doesn't even has no importance. I could be ruminating about like phone numbers that I remember from back when I was a kid. Um, or about, I'm just trying to think about the things I think about before bed. Um, sometimes I'm ruminating about not being able to fall asleep. Um, mm -hmm. how often I, is that? Uh, it's not as much anymore. It's almost like an expected situation of not being able to, but I used to ruminate and look at the clock and like count down the minutes. I used to do this mental math where it would be like, if I fall asleep by this time, I will get four hours or I will get mm -hmm. three hours or I will get two hours. I no longer do that because I've, I've, I've given up on that and it's not helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's those sleep stress thoughts though are really, really common. Um, yeah. I love this, by the way. Like this is so visually soothing to me. Is it? Yeah, what's yeah. this like for you? Oh, that's great. I feel like I'm in therapy. Oh, good. Well, I was like, I hope it doesn't feel like therapy or feel like I'm interrogating you. Um, no, it's great. Okay. Um, had a thought. But, oh, I know. When you start thinking about sleep at some point in the night, do you start stressing out about it? Like, yeah. it, like, okay. Well, what point is there a point in the day where you start? You're like, oh no, it's gonna be bedtime. Yeah. I'm physically and mentally exhausted all the time. So by the time I decide to go into bed, I try to like prolong going into the bed because sleep hygiene stuff. And I'm like, okay, it's eight o'clock. I can finally get off the couch and go into the bed and or whatever time it is, usually 8, 830. Um, then I will lay down. I'll put sometimes I'll put a show on that is just mindless and I'll put it on in the background. I'll probably be asleep in like an hour to an hour and a half because I'm so tired. I start stressing the second I wake up. Mm -hmm. So if I wake up at 130 or two, my mind immediately goes to I am so exhausted. And I am so worried that I'm not going to be able to fall asleep. And that's what happens every single day. Um, and I don't even check the clock anymore. Like when I wake up, I think I've told you I've, I've now woken up at around 2 a.m. And for about 45 straight days. Yeah, which um, is terrible. I don't even look at the clock. I, I know going out into the living room because I'll shift uh, sleeping spaces so I don't wake my wife up by tossing and turning. And I'll look at the clock and be like, yeah, it's 2.01. Ah, it's one forty-eight, and I would have felt like I slept for eight hours. So th oh. I, that when you were texting me about that, I noticed that it seems like you're waking up after like a sleep cycle. So a sleep cycle is usually like three and a half to four hours. Yeah. Um, have you? Well, and I know you just went to the sleep doctor, and it was utterly unhelpful. But like, have you done any medical workups for like sleep apnea, hormone testing to see if like what testosterone? Like, have you done any of the so I've Medical never done louts. hormone testing, but I have done a sleep study, which didn't discover any apnea. So no sleep apnea. Okay. Right. And, and no other significant findings. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, thing, I don't know where this should go in the social component, I assume, but all the jet lag that has to play a role too. Yep. Absolutely. All the time zones, all the all the new environments, like all the Airbnbs or uncomfortable hotel room pillows and all the things that comes with traveling and running retreats and mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Running retreats. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean that like throws off your cycles on so, like, actually I'm going to put that over here. 
um, your biosocial combo is good impact. Um, right. The things that exist in the intersection of both biological and social. So yeah, yeah, the jet lag. And I would also add, actually, I'm going to put that in the biopsychosocial psycho, because I think, here's my guess, is that the jet lag, obviously there's a biological component, there's the social component, because retreats. But then I'm going to guess that you also have a narrative in your mind around like, oh no, I'm coming home. I have jet lag. I'm not going to sleep well. Like, yeah. is that fair? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, So I would put that right in the middle of all three. This is going to sound really weird, but one day, the one moment that I look forward to during all of those travels is the day that I come home because I'm going to be so exhausted from being up early in Europe, coming home, landing at like 10, 11 PM that I will get so knocked out that I will actually sleep until like seven or 8 AM. So you're like excited for that, like one good yeah. night sleep. That's so sad, Patrick. Oh, I know. It's so sad to even say that out loud. Yeah. Um, Okay, tell me a little bit more about your sleep environment. I know it sounds like you sleep in a cold, yeah. dark room. Yep. yep. Um, but you do, the dogs are with you, right? Yeah. So my wife has a CPAP. Not that it, it doesn't make a ton of noise, but it does make noise. Mm -hmm. um, the dogs sleep in there. So we have a Shih Tzu who is unbelievably neurotic, who sleeps in the bed and he wakes up often. Sometimes he's barking. Sometimes he's just scratching. Sometimes he's moving around. We have a larger dog that sleeps on the floor. Um, there are nights where they are having sleep issues and they're up and out of the room constantly because they either need to go out to the bathroom. Our little dog likes to jump off of the bed so he can go into the kitchen and you can watch him drink water. You assume he needs to go to the bathroom, but he just drinks water and then he goes back into the bed. Mm -hmm. But He needs an audience to do it. Mm -hmm. thankfully that's only like two to three times a month but when that happens it does really suck yeah you've got a lot of external factors um yeah. that wake you any other like sensory stuff that wakes you um not not really when i'm having really bad bouts of sleep struggle i will remove myself and try to sleep in our spare bedroom upstairs by myself but even that has not worked recently. Usually that's like a pretty safe bet that that will help me. So that, so like when you're in a bad spout, you'll go to this, I'm going to call that the sterile room. Cause like, yeah, there's, there's no, less. Yeah. But no, and that sometimes helps, but it's not been helping lately. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, Cause you're still waking up. At yeah. Two. Yep. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, what about, so you watch a show in your room. Is there anything else you do in your bed? Um, I'll, I'll read uh, before bed sometimes, and that will almost instantaneously make me fall asleep. Okay. So reading, reading helps. Um, yeah. How's your phone use in bed? So I put my phone in a different room. I put it in the living room every night starting around like 6 p.m. Oh my gosh, that's so like impressive. I have to because like there are nights where I'm, I can tell that I'm feeling more uh, obsessive about checking it. And those are nights where I feel increasingly more anxious. So I really have to create as much separation as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, your phone is away. Yep. Um, starting at six. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Um, Let's see. What else? Are there other things I haven't asked about that you're thinking of or you're associating to as, as this Venn diagram is um, unfolding? I mean, like childhood realizations that as a kid and like teenager, I used to f have this irrational fear of someone breaking into our house constantly. Um, and that would keep me up at night. But that no longer impacts me. So I don't think that feels presently relevant. But that was a constant fear. And that never happened. So, you know. There, there's I'm... like a hypervigilance I yeah. hear around like going to sleep and like, will the world stay safe while yep. I go to sleep? I've had irrational fears where like if I fall asleep, I'm going to die in my sleep. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Which I, again, like given health stuff and I actually hear that. I feel like a lot, especially with autistic people. I mean, if you, if you think about sleep, it's like the ultimate releasing of control. We're like releasing yeah. of our conscious awareness, yeah. which yeah, I, I don't think, and like, I think that's hard for a lot of us. That's, that's spot on. It is that releasing of control. I've had, oh, you asked me what else I've tried. I've had a friend who's a therapist in town offer hypnotherapy. Um, that did not work. And she mentioned that exact statement. She's like, it really looks like you're not able to allow your body to relax enough to go into this state. Mm -hmm. So that makes me also wonder, kind of like nervous system stuff. Do you have a sense either just from like knowing your own body or from some of the bio like markers that are available or not biomarkers, but like biofeedback things. Do you have a sense of if you're like, do you tend to be sympathetic dominant? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Um, okay. Have you, so I know you've tried like meditation, all those things. Have you done like, what have you done with like relaxation type exercises um, to get you into parasympathetic? I've done some mindfulness work. I've done some like breathing and relaxation techniques. I used to use like apps like the Calm app or Mindset Timer, things like that, or Insight Timer. I mean, Do those just stress you out more? Yeah. So, okay, this is something um, I've sometimes noticed, and it's, here's how I conceptualize it. Curious if this will resonate or not. That for some folks, especially especially with complex trauma, um, who are SNS dominant, dipping into the parasympathetic nervous system actually feels really scary because it's like, I'm letting my guard down. But it, because the hypervigilance is my protector, and so mm -hmm. then using relaxation exercises can feel really scary. Does right. that resonate? Yeah. That resonates hundred percent. Okay. Um, so that like, again, from a, like from a body being protective, that makes sense. It's like your body wants to get into parasympathetic relaxation mode, but there's part of your body that's saying that it's not safe to do this. Yep. Um, what I will, what I, what I would historically pair when that's the case is doing not relaxation exercises on your own, but doing it with grounding exercises, like in pairing the two, because the grounding exercises and the grounding exercises for listeners are exercises that kind of bring us back to this present moment. So like the five, four, three, two, one, like five things you can see, four things you can touch, um, those sorts of exercises. Right. Pairing that with relaxation so that there's one to anchor you, remind you you're safe while you're also like practicing, um, tolerating the more relaxed state. Right. Um, our social part is not very, our social part of our sleep Venn diagram, we've got sleep apnea machine, dogs, you're running retreats, dog needs, but are there other social things we haven't talked about that seem important um no i mean we have like drinking alcohol in the social and bio piece but that is a social component so mm -hmm. um i would say but i don't i don't think like i can think of anything that feels um that i would include in there my wife my wife used to have horrific night terrors where she would stand up on the bed and start screaming at the top of her lungs, which was really enjoyable to experience because then she would just immediately go back to sleep as if nothing happened. I would be checking under the bed, in the closet, but that, that, that hasn't happened in years, thankfully, but that was happening. And oh it my was gosh. Horrible. So yeah, like her night terrors would activate probably your existential anxiety about the world isn't safe when I fall asleep. Exactly. Um, yeah. And she would just go back to sleep. Like nothing had happened and I would just be laying there like, what the hell just happened? Yeah. Yeah. That has not happened in years, but that was a uh, horrifying experience. Um, that, yeah, I've had sleep tears and like, it's true. Like the person that has, like you, you don't, you often don't remember them unless yeah. you get woken up. Um, but yeah, sleep tears are terrifying. I mean, they have a good name. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. I sometimes get those. And and I I do think I agree, I because my mom had sleep tears, and it's it's often like more terrifying for the 
the, the spouse or the partner, yep. um, especially if the person's not waking up. Um, okay, well, how do you feel about this little diagram we've created? First of all, does this feel like this captures? This feels like it captures, yeah. Okay. Um, so then, right, the next part is, we like we talked about last week, like we want to look at where can we intervene um, so obviously there's a lot of, a lot of biological components. I think the ones that stand out to me is I didn't realize like with your throat condition, um, how much, it sounds like you're drinking a lot more liquid and it's easier to drink liquid than to eat food. Yeah. Um, and that that's, you know, you're getting up to use the bathroom two to three times a night and then falling back asleep is huge. So that to me, like, that's a huge in the biopsychosocial. I'm like, well, that throat condition really feels significant in your sleep. For sure. Um, so, okay. my There's a lot in the psycho compartment, <laughs> psychological, <laughs> calling it the psycho. Uh, there's a lot in the psychological compartment that I I think you could work, like push a needle on. Is yep. that the phrase? Um, but I don't know, where where would you want to start looking at this? Because I feel like there's a few anchor points where it's like, okay, I could start either working on, I could start working on some of the hydration stuff to see if I'm waking up to use the bathroom less. And then there's less of that. Yeah. I think some of the, the mind racing stuff you could start with. I am definitely think the most tangible feels like the the amount of hydration and the timing of hydration. Like mm -hmm. that's a big one. So if that's going to be a... a a variable in waking up in the middle of the night when you're already asleep to have to use the bathroom, that's a big deal. So that feels like something I can truly anchor into and manage and actually have some control over. Um, mm -hmm. The next part would probably be, I don't know, um, something that's going to have to be more therapeutic, I assume. I am doing consultations with two CBTI therapists tomorrow for sleep, uh, cognitive behavioral Therapy for insomnia, for those of you who don't know what that means, I am not a huge proponent of CBTI, or not CBTI, CBT, but for this specific issue, I am totally willing to give it a shot. I like CBTI. Like, I, I say that in my sleep work book. I'm like, I don't typically like CBT for us, but I like CBTI. Yeah. Um, I'm glad. That's great that you're going to be working with a CBTI person. I think, yeah, given how much rumination and stress and, and just even like your relationship to sleep given yeah. how stressed that is, like, I think that will be huge. I'll be, I'll love hearing your like updates on that. For sure. Um, so hydration. And then the other one, like if you're messing with hydration, um, like changing the 20 ounce afternoon iced coffee to like a 12 ounce, is that yeah. something? Yeah. I'm um, reduction in moderation management so that feels better than saying like just cut it out completely which feels unrealistic yeah to yeah totally I a lot of behavioral health it's about creating realistic goals because a lot of people it's like well i'm going to change this this and this and this and it's like no it's like small changes over time small tweaks yeah. over time for sure um so if we were to make a goal list for you to experiment with and let everyone know how it works afternoon coffee 12 ounce um, how many ounces of liquid do you think you're having in the last, like, five hours, four or five? Um, 36 eight, ounces. 36 ounces in the last, like, five, five hours? Yeah. Okay. Does your throat start hurting if you... Yeah, that's a causation, because by the time the day is getting over with, my voice is now basically used up. So then it wow. takes even more liquid to lubricate my throat to be able to speak. And does like, are, are liquids equal? Like in the sense of like, does tea versus water versus seltzer water, like do some of them soothe more than others or is it all equal? Throat coat tea. Um, throat coat tea is helpful. So I'll drink that. Uh, but yeah, I can certainly start like trying to minimize going from like 36 ounces to 24 or something like that. Well, and that's where I was, because that is that's the complicating factor with, though with your throat. Like, um, yeah. you've got those competing needs there. Where, if, like, if tea is a more effective liquid per an ounce, so switching to something that's like more impactful per an ounce, does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, 
that was so um so shifting the hydration toward earlier in the day and then the sipping i like i would experiment with the sipping versus the gulping and i think tea also would make it easier to sip versus gulp for sure um like that so what um what he said in his um podcast on it was five to eight ounces like 10 hours after you wake up at that point then you should just have five to eight ounces before night if you've hydrated well during the day. And then, it, but with your throat thing, I think you'd want to adjust that. Right. Absolutely. Um, okay. I like concrete goals. So what would be your like ounce of liquid 10 hours after you wake? Well, not, I guess after you get up, because if it's 10 hours after 2 a.m., that's. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't, um, I don't know. <laughs> I I would just like to reduce it a little bit so that it feels manageable. Um, I think that it can go from 96 hour ounces during the day to like maybe 60. Well, I would keep your hydration. I don't think you have to decrease your hydration for the day. It's more about those last several okay. hours. So you could so go from like 36 to like 24. Yeah. And, and partly I'd see how you're throat deals with that and then the sipping it versus the gulping right um and then have you tried cognitive shuffling i have yeah i did it after we did our sleep episode that one day um what was your experience of that didn't really have any impact um i played around with it for like five days in a row and then i was like no give it up (laughs) was your mind wandering or was it like you were doing it for a long time and not falling asleep a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. Um, Happy to yeah. revisit. Yeah, it's so interesting. I Because I have this same thing where I wake up and I start stressing. And it's like every time I actually do cognitive shuffling and actually pull myself back when my mind gets distracted back to the cognitive shuffling, it always works. But it's the, I have to, it's hard because it's like right. I have to train my brain to not go on that divergent thought and to come back to for sure that, the the word um i'm shuffling but well this, how do these goals feel these goals feel good and they feel manageable and they feel like things i can actually do which is what we want to highlight for those of you who are listening is like things we can actually start to implement into our day to day that don't take us an enormous amount of restructuring or effort or energy <laughs> yeah exactly like that's like Looking at this diagram, like it, it's overwhelming, right? Like there's a lot of factors contributing to your sleep stuff. Yeah. And it might be like, what all you're doing is cutting down your caffeine by eight ounces and your water by, by 10 ounces. That's all you're doing. But it's like, that's exactly what, that, that's how we have to start with these things. It's um, one, one, what is it? Like, I hate the metaphor. How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Like, that's a terrible <laughs> metaphor, but that's what's popping in my head. I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't eat animals. Solid, for sure. <laughs> for sure. But yeah, it's, it is about like small, manageable, little steps that can build momentum too, because otherwise mm-hmm. it feel significantly way too overwhelming to do. Yep. Okay. So how, here's what we're going to do, Patrick. Every afternoon maybe not every afternoon, unless you want to, you're going to take a picture of your iced coffee and send it to me and just be like 12 ounces. (laughs) I can do that. Okay, cool. Um, Well, I'm excited for my week. Therapy payment for this last hour of my life because geez Louise felt like a therapy session, which was really good. Sorry. No, that like, that actually makes me feel kind of like awkward. I'm like, Oh, I hope it doesn't feel too. You did such a good job. Um, I, Yeah, that was really helpful to lay it out that way and to visualize it this way and to be able to compartmentalize and and conceptualize. So this is what we want for those of you watching at home, especially if you're watching on YouTube, um, to be able to create something visually and then to break down these experiments step by step, like little tiny tweaks that you can introduce into your life. So it does not feel like you have to look at the whole Venn diagram, get overwhelmed and just say, nothing is ever going to change. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's all about like self-experimenting um, and becoming a you know detective and starting with the little concrete things. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. 
But okay. we will figure out a way for y'all to have access to this aside from the YouTube channel. Maybe we'll put it in a show note as a downloadable. But nevertheless, thanks for following along and just uh, taking the journey on this experiment with us because we know this is a different type of podcast episode today. Next time we're going to do Megan's and then we will keep you all posted on the progress. Thanks, Megan. That was actually super helpful. And to everyone listening to the Divergent Conversations podcast, new episodes are out on Fridays on all major channels and YouTube. Like, download, subscribe, and share. And we will see you next week. Bye.